Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. Now, let's jump into the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Novik Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Ovori. Today, we have a very special episode. On the pod, we have a guest who is responsible for probably something on the order of billions of hours of casual gameplay every week. And if it's not billions, then it's still a very big number nonetheless. Uh, Our guest is none other than the head of games at the New York Times, the gray lady of journalism. The must-read publication that covers everything from U.S. politics to international news, to lifestyle stories, to real estate, to cooking, and even sports via their acquisition of The Athletic. Uh, I'm personally a huge fan of their content, uh, and full disclosure, I'm a subscriber to the news, to the cooking, and I regularly read The Wirecutter for product reviews, which, in my opinion, is one of the hidden gems of the New York Times portfolio. Uh, And of course, I play games. I'm a gamer. Um, I play the crossword, I play the mini crossword, I play Spelling Bee, and of course, I play Wordle, just like so many millions of others. And on Wordle, uh, as I'm sure you are Listeners eager to know, I'm personally on day 383 uh, with a 98% win record, seven seven losses by my count. Uh, and I have exactly, I did the math just before this, this pod, I have exactly four guesses on average, 4.00 literally, uh, which is, you know, it could be better, but at the same time, I'm not necessarily optimizing for uh, win record. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have a good time. That's what you do with games, right? Um, I play hard mode. I don't have a set starting word like I do. And uh, I like to look around and be inspired by my surroundings for which start word I, I, I choose. So I'm sure you all wanted to know that, listeners. Um, the reason we have Jonathan Knight, our guest, head of games at New York Times here, is because uh, we have a really interesting moment in time for the New York Times. Uh, Wordle in particular is somewhat unique in that it came into the portfolio by acquisition, uh, which seems a strategy that New York Times has been employing more, uh, not aggressively, but more frequently recently like with The Athletic. Um, All the other games, as far as I know, are homegrown, internally developed. um, And games definitely don't seem like an afterthought for the times. Uh, Indeed, they seem to be becoming an increasingly important piece of the overall strategy. Uh, So to discuss that strategy and the New York Times in general, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Jonathan Knight, a longtime gaming industry veteran, now head of games at the New York Times, and a former colleague of mine from Zynga uh, back in the day. So Jonathan, Thank you so much for being on the pod. Thanks for having me. Super happy to be here. Awesome. All right. So with that out of the way, we're going to dive into today's episode. Um, So Jonathan, first question. This is super relevant for where we are right now. Tell us a bit more about your gaming industry career. It's long and illustrious. You've been around the block, so to speak. Um, How did you land at the New York Times uh, of all places? (laughs) Um, Not a traditional gaming company, not a traditional gaming studio, certainly. Um, And uh, what are you doing to drive their game strategy forward? Yeah, well, I've been a game maker my whole life, so I um, have worked for, you know, big traditional video game companies. I started out as a producer, a um, little bit creative leaning. I was at Activision, like, early, early days. Um, I moved up to Electronic Arts, where I was a producer and then eventually executive producer uh, for, what, almost a decade. Um, I was really lucky to get onto the Sims franchise right after the first Sims game came out and was part of this amazing team at Maxis building the sequel to the most successful PC game of all time at that time. Um, and, you know, really loved the internal development process, became kind of like, like I said, more of a creative leaning producer, building teams, building products, launching, operating big games, um, worked on the Simpsons at EA, uh, eventually went to Zynga where I spent about five years. Um, I was a general manager there, as you well know. Um, and, Did some cool stuff there. I got really excited about mobile. I ended up running the Words with Friends team at Zynga for a bit when we launched new Words with Friends. I was on the team that brought Farmville to mobile. Um, And after that was at Warner Brothers Games where, you know, I ran the studio there in San Francisco, um, DC Legends. And then eventually we built Harry Potter Wizards Unite um, in a joint um, development production um, 
uh, operation with Niantic Labs, makers of Pokemon Go. So those are some of the things, you know, just kind of highlights there through um, a long period of time. But yeah, basically game maker, studio head, general manager. I guess it was um, just right around the when the pandemic hit, right around lockdown, I left Warner Brothers and kind of had basically that that initial pandemic period off, which was kind of cool um, in a way. And, um, you know, was spending time with the family, you know, like ordering groceries online. Like a lot of us, we were doing hikes in the woods and, and just had a fair amount of time off. And um, in the fall, I guess, I'm trying to remember the sequence, but I basically got a call from New York Times. They were looking for a head of games. Um, I was ready to go back to work and it, it really worked out well um, and was excited about the opportunity. Loved the brand. Um, love what the company stands for, uh, like being able to work on games that contribute to the incredible journalism, right? Like the profits from our games go to um, fueling the mission of the company, which is to seek the truth and help people understand the world. It's right here on my desktop. Um, and, you know, that independent journalism is, is you know, so important to like what the company is doing. And I just love it. It just it brings meaning to the work, basically. Um at the same time, on the gaming side of things, it was an incredible opportunity. Love the games. Um, kind of a open, you know, kind of a, a blank canvas in a lot of ways in terms of like what we can do and where we can go in the future games platform. And we can talk about that. But, you know, love the products, love the opportunity to build something cool and, and love the company. So, um, yeah, I signed on and it's been an awesome couple of years. So uh, was there a previous head of games before you joined? Actually, this wasn't on my list of questions for you, but I'm very curious to hear, um, is this a recent development, recent two years ago, but recent development that the Times is now, you know, really focusing on games and putting this head of games role in there, you know, with you obviously helming it now? Um, or was there a previous head of games or was there was there, was there a holistic games function, so to speak. Of course, New York Times has had games for decades. You know, the, the, the crossword, of course, is, is legendary. Will Shorts, of course, legendary crossword designer. Um, but is this a new thing or is this something that pre-existed, but it's, you know, you're now the new head of it? Yeah, no, it definitely pre-existed. I mean, I think me coming on, that signaled the shift. It was strategic to, to bring on someone from the games industry to help take us to the next level in terms of our game strategy. So that was definitely an intentional shift. But um, yeah, there was an executive director before me, general manager of games. Um, as you said, the Crossword's been around forever. It started in 1942 in the Sunday paper, then moved online. Um, Crossword app came out 2009. So like our history with the Crossword puzzle goes way back and we were early to digital, you know, early online. And basically what happened was... Um, we launched a subscription business for the crossword alongside the new subscription um, a number of years back and started to see people subscribing to the crossword. Um, we've got over hundred, uh, sorry, over 10,000 puzzles going back through the Will Shorts era back to, to 1993. So the, the archive is a big part of it. We had a mini crossword to go along with it. And, um, you know, that those subscriptions just started kind of coming in alongside the new subscriptions and, the, the crossword business was growing. Um, around four years ago, a little over four years ago, um, the team, and this predated me by a couple of years, built Spelling Bee. And that was based on... Uh, Great a, game, by the way. Like, just a really, really fun... Like, I love that game. Yeah, it's that awesome. before Wordle. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And, and you know, I think in a lot of ways, yeah, people should check it out. It's a, it's a word-finding game. Um, it's editorial editorially driven. So we've got an editor for that puzzle who, who puts it out every day um, and curates the list and everything and chooses the words. And, you know, you can find, there's a pangram you find, and there's a bit of a ranking system. So it's, um, you know, it's a word puzzle, but it's also got a little game around it. And it's based on a, a puzzle from the paper that Will Shorts brought to the paper. Um, so, you know, like the crossword, had a history in print, brought it digital. And then what we saw, and we put, um, kind of a pay model on the spelling, spelling bee. It's like free to play model. You can get the first few ranks for free. And then for full experience, you, you have to be a subscriber. And those subscriptions started kind of stacking on top of the crossword subscriptions. And that's when I think the company realized like, oh, it's not just the crossword. We could have a portfolio of games that mm -hmm. people are willing to pay for. Um, and much like 
the thesis of the New York Times is people will pay for quality journalism. You know, the thesis became people will pay for like really great handmade human curated uh, puzzles for you to solve every day. And it's not just crossword, it's also spelling bee. Um, and then the team started building a series of games and we had kind of a portfolio and you subscribe to that. So that's a little bit of the history that that you know, there are eight games that we operate now. Um, we made a couple more tiles, letterbox, vertex. Those were all made and and launched before I came in. And then there was a bit of a kind of a a pause on new games uh, as crossword and spelling bee were driving most of the growth um, and a recognition that like we had this really big opportunity. And that's when um, David Perpich, who at the time was head of standalone products at the New York Times, he hired me. He was my first boss. He was running cooking, wire cutter. He'd overseen the integration of wire cutter games. Um, and he really just had a, a big vision that like we need to invest more in games. Let's bring in someone from game industry to help us figure out like where to go from here. And so that's when I came on board. And so it's very much been a continuation. Some of the team that's been around for, for many, many years is still there, but it's also like a lot of new folks as well. So this brings me to my my next plan question, which is You've alluded to this, but why is the Times focusing so hard on games? You know, obviously the mission of the New York Times is journalism, right? It's a newspaper, right? It's shining light on truth and, you know, uncovering things and sending reporters and journalists around the globe to to cover the news, right? Um, so what role does games play in that? Uh, it, it, you, what is the purpose of the games division as it relates to the overall mission of the New York Times, which presumably is still news, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, so, no, I mean, look, the the I would say the mission of the company, seek the truth, help people understand the world, um, remains unchanged. Our strategy, though, and this was rolled out by um, our CEO a couple of years ago, the strategy is to be the essential subscription for English-speaking, curious people to engage with and understand the world. Uh, and we think that news is at the center of that, but it really means a collection of products. And, you know, one way to think about this, it, like if you think about the classic Sunday paper, right, the New York Times Sunday paper that we used to get back in the day, um, you know, it wasn't just the news, right? It was everything from uh, cartoons to like, I'm looking up show times to the crossword puzzle, Um and, you know, recipes and lifestyle and sports, right? Like all of those things were part of that big Sunday edition. And I think in a way, like we kind of lost sight of that with the digital news product. Um, it became so important for newspapers to adapt, right? 10, 15 years ago to like transition to a digital age. And um, and for the New York Times, like we bet big on, people will pay for quality journalism and the news subscription business, which is doing very, very well for us. But in some ways you sort of lost sight of that original vision of a more complete Sunday paper um, that was about your interests and about your lifestyle and about all those other things besides the news. And, you know, the crossword puzzle, like, like I said, since 1942, it, it, the first one ran during World War II, right? The ultimate tough news cycle. And it was a diversion from the news. And, you know, throughout the years you've heard, you know, I've heard stories like people subscribe to the paper just for the crossword. Like those people are out there. So I think it's not new that this collection of like lifestyle products is part of the, the company strategy, you know, more tactically um, games is a big driver of subscriptions, standalone game subscriptions, people who don't actually take the news, they just subscribe to the puzzles. Um, but also the, what's really cool is we're finding that, um, People who engage with both news and games in a given week, and I should be more specific, subscribers who engage with both news and games within a given week are far more likely to retain than any other combination and more likely than just news only um, or games only. So we're really seeing that like when people take the the subscription package and we offer an all access package where you can get news, games, cooking all for one price. Um, that that engagement with multiple products does drive better long-term retention. And so that sort of speaks to why the strategy is what it is. Um, so yeah, we play a big, big part in that strategy, as does cooking. So that to me makes total intuitive sense. You know, I, at Zynga and I'm sure throughout your career and my career, you know, we've talked about games as a daily habit. You know, Mark Pincus, you know, founder and CEO, 
original CEO of, of, of Zynga, um, was all about the daily habit, right? You know, like, how do we fit into your day? Make us the best part of your day. You know, Zynga games are, you know, the thing that you look forward to and, and come back to. Um, the wire cutter, as much as I love it, and I mentioned it's the hidden gem, it's not something you need every day. You know, it's the kind of thing that you need when you're looking to make a purchase and you're like, okay, which one of these should I choose? Um, but that's sporadic at best. Um, the uh, cooking, yes, you could argue, and you also alluded to this, that kind of goes up the next level, which is like, okay, I, I'm cooking most days of the week. Um, and so I need I need recipes. And I absolutely love that. I have literally have, I should show you this. Uh, it's in my kitchen, so I can't. But I have a massive binder full of printed recipes from New York Times cooking. It has other recipes too, but it's mostly New York Times cooking recipes. Um, and I have my favorite chefs and, 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 you know, recipes and, and collections. Um, so that's What's kind of the next level. What's your go-to guilty pleasure, Nico? Is it chocolate chip cookies? No, it's not. I'm not a sweets guy. I'm more of a savory guy. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of the, uh, I'm a big meat eater, big carnivore. Um, I know in the Bay Area, that's, that's, a, that's a no-no. But uh, uh, a lot of the kind of meat recipes, uh, instant pot recipes coming from the New York Times are really good. And then slow cooker recipes. Those are also my, my uh, guilty pleasures right on. On, the, on the weekends. But um, uh, the next level up then is really is games, right? And games as a daily habit is really a big theme. Um, and I'm curious, is that the reason you acquired Wordle? Because Wordle clearly is literally designed to be played one game per day daily appointment. I mean, the, the, the crossword already was that. But Wordle to me seems like almost the extreme because ver- crossword is not for everyone, right? Crossword, it takes mm. time. You got to sit down. You got to spend a lot of time on, on figuring things out. I rarely finish the crossword as much as I love it. Like it's, it's just too hard for me. Um, as much as I love it, I like the challenge. When I do finish it, I'm extremely excited. Wordle is the kind of thing, I, I mentioned my stats at the start, and it's not a, you know not by accident. I'm sharing them because 98%, like most people can get 90% completion. You know, Most people will finish it every day. And I am extremely curious to hear what was the rationale, what was the thought process uh, behind the Wordle acquisition, and how does that fit into your portfolio? Obviously, it fits extremely well, <laughs> clearly, yeah. cleanly. But what was the rationale and how did that acquisition actually go down? Like, how, Tell us about, about the mechanics of that. Okay, right on. Yeah, no, there's like five or six questions in there. Nico. I know, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, like, I like to throw <laughs> okay. them all out there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. No, Wordle, let's talk Wordle. Um, it's, you know, it's an amazing little puzzle. Like it's, you know, I feel really fortunate, first of all, to have been part of it. Um, internet sensation, you just don't, they don't come along very often. You know, I, one day I was watching CNN and there's, Anderson Cooper interviewing Monica Lewinsky about her wordle habit. And that's when I knew like, oh my God, we're, we're involved in something that's just like gone fully mainstream, fully viral global. Um, in 2022, wordle was the most searched, uh, Google term across the entire planet. Um, it was, it was crazy. Um, and you know, it's just one of those games, lightning in a bottle, um, however you want to call it, like uh, Josh Wardle, the creator of the game just knocked out of the park. Um, I think in some ways it was less about um, us going like, oh, Wordle, perfect, like filling a hole for us in terms of like um, a daily habit. As you said, our games are all actually daily puzzles. That's just sort of who we are. Um, And spelling bees once a day, crossword once a day, you know, tiles um, for a text letterbox. The smaller games, um, you know, have some subtlety around that, but like the big ones are definitely like single day puzzles. And that's actually one of our like creative pillars is time well spent. Like we, we actually don't want 24 seven engagement out of you. Like that's not our goal. Um, we want one really great human crafted puzzle. And if you choose to do two or three of them, or maybe you do spelling B plus Wordle, or maybe you, like I say, crosswords, not necessarily for everyone, but we have a diehard group that they're there just for the crossword and they don't care about all these other like, um, games. So it's important to us to have just like we are part of the New York times um, bundle of products within the games product. It's important that we have um, a suite of offerings because different people have different tastes, different needs, um, and so forth. So, but I think that idea of the the human made puzzle once a day, time well spent, and then you can put it down and come back tomorrow um, is actually really core to who we are. Um, 
I don't want to speak for Josh Wardle, but the other thing to think about, and he sort of said this publicly, is like he and his partner, um, big fans of New York Times games. He's based in New York, New York engineer. They play Spelling Bee, play the mini, and and he really wanted to make a game. He wasn't a game maker. It's his first game, basically. Um, and But they were really inspired in a lot of ways by the game, the New York Times games they were playing. So I think in that way, um, he was thinking about us, and it helped sort of like make it such an obvious fit for, for our um, portfolio. I think you're right though, that, you know, a Sunday crossword can take, um, can take hours. Although we have people that, you know, we've, we've seen our, you know, our solver community is pretty intense. There's people that will solve really hard crossword puzzles very quickly, but um, you know, I, that is a different kind of need and, and in some ways a different segment. Um, Spelling bee for me really brought in families. It's more social. It's got a Twitter following kind of like um, kids can play it. You know, it's like kind of a kids and mom game. Like moms really like people play spelling, their kids play spelling bee because it's kind of good for your brain, um, but it's still a fun game. Um, you know, you can, you can do it like in a few sessions, but you do kind of come back to it. Like it's, it's um, you know, it's a game that, that will, there's a puzzle that'll stick with you and you put it down and you see if you can find some more words, maybe you go look for hints. And so it does, it is kind of a multi-session game. Uh, and but I think Wordle, you know, to your point, like just it almost did to Spelling Bee what Spelling Bee had done to the crossword. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like even more mainstream, even more accessible, approachable. Um, you can do it in a few minutes and put it down and you're kind of done. Like some people do it first thing in the morning and then they, they're done for the day. So I think it kind of carried that trend um, to to the next level. And um, all, obviously, as a result, really widened the funnel um, and it just, just, you know, brought in a huge, huge audience. Okay. In terms of the acquisition, like I can't say too, too much about it. And like, I can't reveal too many details, but, um, you know, honestly, there's not that much to reveal anyway, if I'm, if I'm being totally <laughs> honest with you, like we, uh, the New York times ran a story about Josh Wardle, who'd made a game called Wordle. And the story ran, I think on January 3rd. Um, and, you know, people had started to play the game. It was catching on. He uh, had made it for his partner as kind of a love letter. They made mm-hmm. it together. Um, and uh, then he shared it with friends and family. And then one day he woke up and there's 75 people playing it. And the next day he woke up and there's, you know, 300,000 people playing it. It just, it went viral. It had a very unique kind of sharing mechanic um, that helped it really catch on in terms of like social media and, you know, chat, you know, private chat threads and so forth. It's like that little grid of, of oh, yeah. green and yellow squares. Um, and it just started spreading. And so like throughout that December, the game had been growing. New York times reporter kind of got wind of it. And this, you know, the interviewed Josh about it and we ran a lovely story. Um, that went around the office. I, I'm, I'll be honest with you. That's when I first started playing worlds when we did an article about it. So that's actually how it came to my attention. And, um, you know, immediately, Everybody thought like this should be a New York Times game. And in fact, some people thought it was a New York Times game. It was just, it seemed like such a great fit for us. So um, on January 5th, I had my first phone call with Josh, basically called him up and said, would you want to sell the game to us? Um, He was, you know, he was in the mood to sell. He said, yes. Um, And, you know, we kind of did a negotiation and on January 31st announced to the world that we'd acquired Wordle. So it was very fast. We kind of did the deal. fast. That is about the quickest deal that I've probably ever heard of, but that's insane. Wow. I did not know that, uh, how quick it happened. Yeah. Very, very fast. Um, I think he, uh, again, I don't want to speak for him. He had a thing he wanted to go do and running Wordle was not the thing that he wanted to do. He had no idea it was going to blow up like that. Um, you know, he'd written a very simple piece of JavaScript code that was no back end. Um, the solutions to the puzzle were just like sitting right there in local storage in your browser. Um, like he was getting thousands, tens of thousands of emails. Like everything was blowing up on Twitter. Everybody wanted to interview him. Like, and it's just, you know, it's not what he wanted. Um, he was really looking for a home for the game. Um, he, you know, he was inclined for, for that home to be New York times. We very much wanted the puzzle. We thought it would fit great with our portfolio. And I think we wanted to be stewards of the game. Right. And, um, I like to think that's why he went with us. He had other companies interested, of course. Um, but you know, he kind of liked what we stood for in terms of, and, and I think, you know, we, we sort of 
didn't want to change the game. You know, we didn't want to break it. We didn't want to like monetize it in a weird way. Like we wanted to keep it, stay true to, to the game that he made. And um, so I think that was, that was kind of part of why it all worked out. Um, and I'm glad it did, but yeah, the game was blowing up all throughout that period in January um, and just got, got really, really big. And I'm just really glad we got to a great deal. And then the hard work began as we, you know, redirected the traffic to our site, um, realized, you know, how basic the game was and we needed to integrate it into our platform, our systems, hook it up to a back end, allow you to create an account if you want your stats and streaks preserved. Um, and, you know, kind of the rest is history. But yeah, that's that's kind of how it went down and um, it was exciting. No, no joke. That's, that's a crazy story and it's kind of, yeah. It's actually fairly reminiscent of Words with Friends. I know that's a studio you ran, but obviously it was founded, um, you know, before and then was acquired by Zynga. And it was a very similar, I think, uh, story. So I, I wonder how much of that story of the Words with Friends story um, actually resonated with you when you were looking at Wordle and 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 this particular chapter in your career? It, it resonated a lot. And people who work with me will yeah. confirm that I, I, I kind of referenced that a lot. Um, you know, like games like this don't come along that often. Um, I was, you know, I looked under the hood at... at after my first, you know, signed an NDA with Josh, got a look at the Google Analytics dashboard. I could see the retention for myself um, after the first couple of days. And, and you know, based on my experience, was just able to sort of say, okay, that looks good. Um, that's what good retention looks like. And so there was, a, you know, it was a concern that a game like that could just pop and then completely drop, right? Like we've seen those before. Um, I remember, it was a draw, gamble. Draw something, draw something, anybody? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, days. Look, but great game, by the way, great game. And obviously like blew up like nuts. But of course, uh, you know, Zynga bought it at, at its peak, I think for 180 million. And then literally the next day it started to decline and, you know, still a great game. Don't get me wrong. Um, and probably a decent acquisition. Mm. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you're right. Like these viral sensations tend not to stick around for very long. And that's why it's so fascinating how well Wordle has stuck around and how sticky, like I, I literally, like 383 days, like that's me playing every, I, I've I missed a couple of days. So I don't have a 383 streak because I went on vacation and various other bits and pieces. But like, I have literally played that game every single day. And I, I know that the, the people who play that game do exactly that. They play it every single day, right? And that's where this daily habit piece, like it is a daily habit in a way that very, very few things ever become a daily habit, right? Even though we talk about games as a daily habit. And so where am I going with this? Like where I'm going with this is it is just remarkable how well it fits in with the New York, in my opinion, with the New York Times strategy. And of course you, you saw that too, and which is why you did the deal. But that is exactly what the New York Times is all about. Like, go to the, read the news, pick your recipe for the for the evening. If you're going to cook that day, do the wordle, do the crossword, right? And it just seems like such a perfect fit. And so, yeah, if there was ever a a, a world in which you're trying to pair a game with another consumer habit, i.e., news in this case or cooking, this is literally the perfect incarnation of that. And I, I don't know how well, you know, kudos to you, Jonathan, for, for getting this deal done and, and, you know, finding a home for Wordle um, at the times, but it just seems such a good fit. Um, and that's what strikes, that's why I wanted to talk to you. Like, it just strikes me as something, I don't want to over-index on Wordle here because obviously we have lots of other things to talk about too. Um, but this is the one thing that, that strikes me as just really remarkable, how well it fits in with the yeah. portfolio one, and the approach. Well, yeah, one thing, uh, one more thing I'll say about Wordle, which I think, you know, may be obvious, but it certainly for me is a big part of why it's so successful and why it has remained. And we're really happy with the continued level of engagement with the game. Um, we haven't disclosed any like numbers. We did say tens of millions of people came into the New York Times with Wordle. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to see, like it's come down a little off its its uh, of viral heights as, as anything would, but um, we're actually pretty happy with um, where we are right now. And I think um, a big part of it is because it's a social game. You know, you mentioned Words mm. with Friends and 
it's not an obvious social game in the way that Words with Friends was, right? Like that's literally a multiplayer game. And um, its virality was a lot around like invites and then getting into game and then the push notification, hey, it's your turn. And then you take your turn and you push back to the other person. And now you've got a real person waiting for you to take your turn. And and that's how that that game works. And a lot of other games have been built around that like asynchronous multiplayer mechanic, right? Um, Wordle is ostensibly like this single player puzzle in the way that the crossword is. Um, I think, as I mentioned with Spelling Bee, what we saw is that, you know, sort of a community grew up around it on on Twitter. It's like the hive mind. And, um, you know, we have a Spelling Bee forum. It gets a thousand comments a day. Like there's hints and, uh, and there's a cool grid you can go to for tips and stuff. So that, you know, there was community around that, right? With Wordle, um, what happened was there's no actual multiplayer mechanic in the game, but the sharing out of your solution for the day, it's so ingenious. It's a little story, right, about how you solve the puzzle that day that that is kind of UGC, right? It's, very, it's, it's different. It, it's almost like very, very rare will you see the same grid from two from two of your friends on the same day, right? It does happen, but like almost always there's a little unique story. Um, And I think that's why the puzzle is really successful, by the way, is because of all the permutations. You start with the word and then you go to the next word. These these letters were were the right ones, wrong place. These are right letter, right place. These wrong, like, and so there's, there's just sort of endless permutations, right, of where it goes. And then you whittle it down and you eventually solve the puzzle. And that in turn generates these like very, very unique moments of UGC every single day. And you share those out and it's like, I solved it. You know, I did it in three, I did it in four, I did it in five. Here's how I did it. But it doesn't give away the answer, right? It doesn't yeah. spoil it either. So that balance of like sharing, but not spoiling. I mean, it's so clever. And what happened was people basically... I, we didn't have to create a multiplayer feature for the game, which is expensive, right? Because WhatsApp is doing that for me, right? Mm-hmm. I'm on a thread, you know, it's titled Wordle Winners. There's a dozen of us on that thread. It's like friends and family. And we use that channel to basically do push notifications, right? And remind each other every day to play the game. And we're seeing like, really from in my experience and you know we worked on a lot of social games like i'm blown away by the percentage of share you remember at zynga we were always optimizing for you know sends per sender and percent sending (laughs) the percent sending um i mean sends per sender is once per day because it's wordle and that's it but the percent sending is so high never seen anything that high and it has just stayed that high um Mm -hmm. the entire lifetime of the product so far so i think that's really the core of why and you know and mark pinkus would be so happy to hear me say that you know social (laughs) wins social wins i'm sure he's a listener by the way i'm sure he's a listener (laughs) but yeah no that's it i just think social wins uh every time games have always been social they always will be and and uh it just shows up in different ways for different games and that's how it manifests for for wordle yeah uh just a, a a pet peeve of mine is uh the ones that I've lost are always the ones where you're you're henpecking the last letter so there's like you've you've got four of the five and there's one letter missing and you've got it probably in three you know that's typically my my story like I've got it in three or three or four and then there's one letter missing but it could be one of like six different letters or five different letters and so you just guess at it um, and then you know that's when you fail. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I don't know how to solve for that. I'm not pretending to be a word game designer, but uh, I'm just telling you my my personal experience, <laughs> my personal pet peeve. Those are the seven or eight games that I've lost are all fall into that category where it's like uh, essentially you've got the word in three or four, but then there's that one letter that's missing, uh, and it could be yeah. A K you're not alone in that. It 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 basically like all games are some combination of uh, you know luck skill, yeah. power, if it's a power-based game. Um, and I think on those days, luck plays a bigger role than we want it to in Wordle, right? And so that's where people end up getting a little bit frustrated. And by the way, it's totally okay because those are the ones that I actually share. So I don't share the ones that I get. I share the ones that I don't get. Um, so those, <laughs> just, you know. We see that in the data, by the way. And um, it's super interesting because, you know, initially when we had days like that and a lot of streaks broken and a lot of anger on Twitter, right? You thought, <laughs> oh man, this is going to be bad for, uh, you know, it might be bad for engagement. And, you know, next day we kind of look at the the numbers 
percentage of people sharing their score, absolutely unchanged. Mm -hmm. Engagement the next day, you know, return rate, absolutely unchanged. It's something amazing about that puzzle that even in those kind of like uh, moments of rage when you're super mad, you still share and you still come back the next day. Yeah, no, and that, that's totally my experience. All right, uh, I have one final question on Wordle, and then we're going to move on to some other things here. Um, so uh, we we know the backstory, or we we think we know the backstory at least uh, as as it's been told, which is you know it was a, it's essentially a love letter to Josh's um, partner, um, and that she was actually the original creator uh, of the list of five letter words that are acceptable in the game uh, and she apparently called it down I got this from Wikipedia so you tell me if I'm wrong or not um, but uh, she apparently called down a list of 12,000 five letter words from the English language to about 2,500 um, and those are the ones that are acceptable in the game and I'm presuming it's because they're you know weird words that you know shouldn't be used and like nobody would be like what what is this like this is not a word right so I get it but 2500 is actually not a big number again I mentioned I'm on 383 um and I I didn't get to the game as early as you know the, the very beginning um what happens when we run out of words <laughs> uh, what is the wordle team going to do uh to make sure that this it's a fresh list I'm presuming every word is is new there are no repeats so far at least. Uh, yeah, you're nodding your head, so I, I take that as a yes. Um, but we're about a third of the way through, and this this game shows no signs of stopping, certainly not for me. I'm going to keep going. But what happens when we run out of 2,500 words? Um, where do we go from there? Um, yeah, I have no idea. We got to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> like, we totally have to figure that out. Um, I, you know, we. what I will say is that um, it's... It, First things first, like for us, it was kind of a journey in getting the game integrated with our platform and, and our backend, as I mentioned. Um, we didn't even have control over the solutions list uh, for quite a long time and uh, longer than I would have liked. Um, but we do now have that in place. And, um, you know, we now publish out the solution every day the way that we publish out the crossword, the way we publish out the spelling bee puzzle. Um so it's in our, it's a tool that's integrated with our other like publishing tools and publishing pipeline. Um, and we now have an editor assigned to the game. Her name's Tracy Bennett. Um, she's uh, been in the crossword world for a long time. Um, she's one of our crossword editors. She's on our editorial team um, and she looks after Wordle. So there is a person and it was Josh's partner in a way. It was the original, as you pointed out, the original editor of Wordle. And Tracy is now the um, New York Times editor of Wordle. And so she she looks after what that word is every day. And you're right. Like, and we have some standards around that. And um, and you know, it's you know, it's it seems like a simple thing. Pick the word of the day. There was actually a really funny um, video that went around last year, um, kind of making fun of. I don't know. Did you see that? It's like a spoof on. Um, the, the guy in it, he's a little bit like me in a way. I think they're kind of making fun of me as the head of games, New York times. And it's a whole um, satire about a team that has to pick the word of the day. And and the main guy's like super mad when like his team brings a bad word and, you know, go back and find a better word. It's really funny if you haven't seen it. Um, so she looks after it. And I think, yes, we will need to figure out what happens when we, when we run out. But the, um, you know, the story there really quickly was just like, Josh didn't expect the game to blow up. All the answers were just plugged into your local browser. Um, people could crack it open, look at what the answers were going to be. And we did find the need to change what the word was going to be um, at one point last year, but we couldn't guarantee everybody got it because if you hadn't like refreshed your browser and gotten the new code, or if you'd like bookmarked it onto your Apple home screen in a way that at the right time, like you might actually get a different word than everybody else who got like the updated. So we were bifurcating the solutions um, because the tech wasn't ready and that was really problematic. So we basically took the time to get that right. And as of what, a few months ago, we now like finally control the list and um, we want the words to be simple words that everybody knows. Occasionally they can be a little tricky. We think that's kind of fun. Obviously, we're curating to make sure there's nothing offensive or particularly like newsworthy. We don't want Wordle to be controversial. We want it to be just a fun sort of diversion from the news. So there's a little bit of thought that goes into all of that. Um, and yeah, the next hill to take will be, do we circle back and repeat words? Will you have forgotten three years from now? Or will you be like, oh, no, you know, like they can't do ocean again. They already did that. So um, we'll, we'll have to work through all that. 
Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, so let's move on from Wordle. Uh, obviously, Wordle is a is a worthy topic of conversation, and I'm glad we we got to to hear a little bit of the origin story and you know where it's going and where it's been. Um, but let's talk more about New York Times games in general. And uh, one of the things that I'm very interested by is that uh, you've had a couple of uh, r- recent announcements in the in the past few months. Uh, you announced uh, a partnership with Delta Airlines. Uh, where Wor- well, it's Wordle again, but Wordle will be available on planes. Um, you also did a deal with Hasbro, as, uh, as I understand it, to take Wordle into a physical board game format. Um, are these types of brand ex- and, and maybe there might be others that I'm I'm missing here. Please fill us in if if there are. Um, but my question really is, are, are these types of brand extensions, new platforms, partnerships, is that something you're looking to do more of? Uh, is it just Wordle? which of course is a phenomenon, right? Like it is truly an internet sensation. Um, Or are your other games also going to be available in more places? Yeah, so first of all, the Delta deal, Wordle Wordle does get a lot of the headlines, um, but the Delta deal that we announced is for for like the, the... New York Times games product more broadly. So, you know, we're excited about that deal. Um, Delta is going to be offering free Wi-Fi this year, as they announced, and we were part of that announcement along with a few other big partners like Paramount Plus. And so you'll, you know, basically log on when you're on the plane uh, using your device, not the in, you know, not the in-seat device, but your device, um, and get onto the free Wi-Fi, and you'll have a portal there. And New York Times games will be will be front and center. And basically, you're getting free access to our games. So the full version of Spelling Bee, for example, as opposed to the, the you know the one that's gated. Um, and of course, our free games like Wordle, Crossword Mini will will continue to be free um, for you on the plane. So it, it is kind of the New York Times uh, games product as a whole, not just Wordle for for the Delta deal. Um, the Hasbro one made a lot of sense for us. They came to us. They were really excited about um, a board game version of Wordle for the holidays. Um, they obviously are kind of a world-class partner when it comes to board game design. And um, our thing there was like, let them do what they do best. We were involved in it and making sure it was on brand and and all of those things. Then that there was good like cross-promotional opportunities, just QR codes, you know, in the box, um, that kind of thing. I think like, look, yeah, we're open to those in the future. I mean, those are, I would say, big, important partners who are, um, are great brands and do a really high quality job and, you know, are kind of experts in their domains. Um, and, you know, we want to see New York Times games played by more people. Like if, if, if I can reach new audiences, um, captive audiences, like folks on a plane, um, you know, and we can do that with like really high quality partners. We're, we're absolutely open to that. Um, you know, our, I, my vision for New York times games is to be the premier subscription destination for digital puzzles. And, you know, chasing that vision means we need to reach new audiences in new places. And and that's what those deals are about. And this is a very natural segue to another question I wanted to ask, which is you obviously have, and by you, I mean, New York times in general games. Yes. But New York times in general has a very, very big cultural imprint. Obviously, the New York Times has been around forever, and it's the premier newspaper uh, uh, for most most people, many people <laughs> uh, in the United States and and globally. Um, and I, I'm just curious, like, how big is the games team um, at the Times? You know, again, the crossword, you know, Will Shorts, legendary. You know, it's been around since 1942, as you mentioned, um, literally. Second World War, like we're talking a very, very long time, and literally, as you said, uh, the worst news cycle ever, <laughs> um, and that comes out. Uh, and of course, now you have a portfolio of eight games, uh, of which I think uh, the, the crossword, the mini um, Wordle, of course, and Spelling Bee are probably the biggest, and then the other four are, you know, probably a little bit smaller. But nevertheless, a huge cultural imprint, a huge cultural impact, um, and something that. Everybody knows, like everybody knows the New York Times crossword. Everybody knows Wordle. Um, you know, where is the team going? How big is the team? Where are you going? Uh, what's the portfolio look like? You mentioned earlier in this in this podcast that, um, you know, you had launched all these new titles and then you kind of slowed down a little bit because they didn't have perhaps the impact or the, the adoption that you had hoped for. Um, where does the Times team, the games team, go from here at the Times? Um, and, and how do you grow beyond something like a Wordle, of course, which was a, you know, flash in 
the pan once in a lifetime, you know, once in a billion opportunity to acquire just this incredible uh, property. Yeah. Again, a few questions in there, but I'll talk about yes. team to the best of my ability first, and we can talk about like new games. Um, we don't really divulge team size numbers, but I I'll start with the editorial team because that stuff's public. So, um, you know, you're right. Like the crossword always had a single editor. The first one was Margaret Farrar, a female editor coming out of the World War II era, and I think she was editor for quite some time. Uh, Will there was a couple of others, and then Will Shorts took over in 1993. Um, you know, just so you know, like. Will doesn't just make the crossword every day and push it. it is a big operation. We have an incredible community of constructors and we basically take submissions from all over the country. Um, we get hundreds of submissions a month. And then um, we have an editorial team that like curates those and works with the constructor to kind of give them the New York Times um, flair and polish. And that community uh, you know, is really excited about being published with the New York Times. We also, some of our editors do construct puzzles as well, and 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 those get published. Um, we're diversifying that community um, every year, um, and we've made great strides in bringing in new constructors, debut constructors, uh, more female constructors than ever before. We've got constructors from underrepresented groups. We're really kind of modernizing um, in a lot of ways, like the crossword puzzle and and making sure that the clues are staying relevant, that they're inclusive, that they're broadly representative. Um, we have an editorial director who kind of drives the vision for, for that. So you've got Will, you've got, um, when I, when I took the job, it was Joel and Sam who had kind of come up with Will, Joel Fogliano, um, who also makes the mini every day. And Sam Azarski is a big part of the crossword um, editorial team. And, um, an incredible constructor himself. And he um, looks after Spelling Bee every day. And so that was sort of the editorial operation. And and um, when I was brought on, we had just hired uh, Winna Liu and Tracy Bennett. And so that took the editorial team to five. And we've just brought on Christina Iverson, which takes it to six. And so there's like six editors who look after largely the crossword pipeline. Um, you know, some do some constructing the other games. And then a seventh, Everdeen Mason, who's the editorial director, and she's kind of the the leader of of the group. Um, and and so that's like the team. But then we have a big cross functional like digital product development team um, that you know builds and operates and grows our our product. Right. So you can play our games on the New York Times app. You can play them on NewYorkTimes.com on website or mobile web, and you can play them on our dedicated uh, crossword app, which is separate from the New York Times. Uh, news app. And that crossword app is being rebranded to New York Times game and is uh, inclusive of obviously more games at this point than crossword. You can play Spelling Bee, Wordle. And literally just today, we launched a Sudoku puzzle in our app um, and that ramped to 100% today. So excited about that. So to play all of our games across all those different surfaces requires a big um, digital product team. And we also have a unified back end and we're storing stats and streaks and there's a lot more we want to do with that kind of stuff going forward. So um, engineers, front-end engineers, web, native, API engineers. Um, we've got product management team, obviously, um, an incredible product design team. Um, and we have producers and program managers who are sort of the glue, bringing it all together, data analysts. We have a research um, lead who's amazing. So uh, without disclosing any numbers, like get a sense there for like, it's a good size team. And I think we're unique among our peers. Like, you, you know, we have invested in a real games platform, a real games team. We're continuing to grow. Um, I think the team has doubled in size in the last two years since I've been here and, and we have continued open positions to fill. Um, so yeah, that's anyway, that's a little bit about the team. Um, you know, in terms of like new games pipeline, it's true that we had um, kind of paused a bit right before I was hired. Um, not necessarily because those games weren't doing well, like tiles, you'd be amazed at the, you know, at the traffic numbers on tiles. Like a lot of people play tiles every single day. Um, you know, letterbox is smaller, but it's got a, you know, dedicated following. So those games are popular. I think, and you all know this and, and your listeners probably know that anyone sort of works in games. Like it is expensive to launch and maintain a game. Um, there are only so many, hours in the day that your players have. Um, and there's only so many resources, you know, that you have as a studio, 
Um, and whenever you launch something, you know, Supercell is like the classic, you know, most extreme version of this, right? They'd have a game that for any other studio would be a smash hit and they go, nope, we're not going to launch that because once we do, like that is going to suck up a lot of our time and resources and we only want to support like the very biggest and best games. And so I think that for us is a little bit, you know, the strategy, like we would love to have more puzzles added to the portfolio, um, but we're going to have a pretty high bar for that. We've got an internal prototyping team, um, which I'm excited about. We have some cool stuff that we're going to be testing uh, with real consumers this year. So I, we're going to have, um, uh, and it's kind of breaking news, I guess, but not that, not that big of news, but we'll, we'll have two pretty confident. We'll have two puzzles that we'll beta test with real, um, consumers this year. And if they take off, like maybe we'll end up supporting them. If not, we'll just sunset them and try more things. But, you know, Wordle was our big new game for last year. And mm-hmm. if we have a Wordle, like I don't need another new game for <laughs> a little while. Um, but we're always going to be working on new ideas kind of in the background. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, yeah, love that, and that, that makes total sense. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day, and you know, some of the, you know, I'm sure the times once people are reading the news and doing the cooking and reading product reviews on Wirecutter and then playing the games, and then ah, that's it. You're going to bed and sleeping, and then waking up and doing it all over again. So, yeah, no, I totally get it. Like, there's only so many um, hours in the day that can be consumed by content, which could be you know news content or or cooking content or games content. Okay. Um, we are uh, nearing the end of our episode here, um, but I do want to ask you a couple of questions. So um, uh, our listeners know that I, uh, generally speaking, host the Web3 Gaming segment. This obviously is not that. That's okay. This is a very exciting and interesting segment, and I'm thrilled to catch up with Jonathan and, and talk about this. Um, but I do want to ask you, uh, does the New York Times have a view on Web3 and or NFTs? Um, if not, which I already know the answer to this, but Jonathan, you're going to give it to us uh, straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, if not, why not? Um, there's been a lot of a, a lot of legacy companies have adopted, you know, NFTs and Web three. This CNN did their big collection of of moments in history. Uh, I'm an owner of quite a few of those. Um, I'm very curious. Like, if if anybody was going to embrace Web three and NFTs and blockchain technology, I feel like the New York Times has an incredible portfolio of content that could be really interesting, not just games, uh, you know, but, but moments in history um, and that the New York Times has covered. And I'm just curious, uh, what are you doing internally, both in gaming, or gaming or the, the other parts of the company? Yeah, I don't have a super exciting answer for you this on this <laughs> one. Um, like, uh, I don't have anything to say about like our company point of view on on that. Like, there have been internal discussions. I've been involved in it. Like, we've looked at it. I think ultimately we just have a really like exciting strategy with our digital subscription business. Um, we're very focused on the all access bundle um, and explaining to people why you know they should take the bundle um, and be introduced to more of our products and and just driving that like be that essential subscription for curious people looking to understand and engage with the world um, having best in class products in their own categories whether that's games or product recommendations or cooking as you've said um, but also the role they play in the overall bundle um, that's just so much work and we're just so focused on that the tech of it all like obviously the editorial the newsroom um, and you know the business side of, of of kind of driving that subscription optimizing you know that funnel um, having the right kind of messaging for consumers um, doing that across all of our different platforms like it's just a lot of work and I think you know the reality is that's where we're focused. Um, we've had to, you know, say no to some things that were in the pipeline, um, new products. We've had to prioritize, like a lot of companies just make tough decisions. And I think it, the simple answer is just focus. Um, it's just not a focus for us. Um, you know, I think we write about it quite a bit and, and I'm not the yeah. guy to interview about that, but the, you know, I think our, our tech reporters are, you know, some of the best in the world and and they're up to speed on everything going on there, but um, not a focus for us in terms of productizing. Fair enough. And then you as a longtime, lifelong, you know, gamer and game developer, game executive, um, do you have a view on Web3 Gaming for for our audience? I'm, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are and, and where you think the industry is headed. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I think... Um, you know, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit skeptic of things like, you know, the metaverse. I'm, I'm like, I'm a little bit skeptic that we can 
you know, manufacture sort of this, I think there's like a, sometimes a tendency to look back and go like, well, that was web one, you know, and that was web two. And, you know, in hindsight, it seems like it all was kind of planned out. So surely we can manufacture web three. Um, but I think it, it, it tends not to work that way. I think you, you wake up and you look back and you'd be like, oh, that felt a lot like web two. But at the time, you know, when whatever Facebook was blowing up and Amazon was blowing up, um, were we all kind of there going like, this is web two, it's happening as we all predicted it would. It's a little bit in, in retrospect, I think. Um, and I think like kids these days are growing up already in a kind of metaverse. It's, it's um, Fortnite, Roblox, is creator communities, like brands are now kind of like, you know, all jammed into games in a way it's, it's about social, like it's hangouts, you know, you go and see concerts, you can do whatever, like that stuff's all happening. And, um, I don't think we're going to need like this big moment where we all put on headsets to be in the metaverse. I think it's a gradual progression of it. Um, you know, do I think blockchain technology is awesome? I do, you know, I'm, i like, I own some digital currency, like I'm a believer in, um, you know, I'm a believer in the idea of the digital ledger and the decentralization of that and, and sort of what that brings to digital ownership. And I've dabbled in it myself over the years. And, and I'm kind of hoping that that some of that really catches on with people. But there's, you know, there's just a lot of friction to a lot of that. I mean, I think what we saw with Web 2 is just like, oh, man, here's my iPhone and here's like a stream of content. And, um, you know, social media was just like dead simple and accessible to the world instantly. And you know, we're not really seeing the that kind of like instant accessibility and instant adoption um, with some of this stuff. So, look, it's anybody's guess. Is it because oh, it's just early and that's a simple problem? We'll make it frictionless one day and and it'll be great. Or is the fact that it's not really catching on even in its primitive stage a, a, sort of a a sign that it's not ever going to? Like a, that's a, a debate. I come down a little bit on the latter, not the former, but uh, we'll see. All right. Well, I appreciate the insights, um, and I think we're right about at the end of our time here. So, um, Jonathan, I just want to say a huge thank you for coming on the pod today. Uh, love the insights. Got a lot of we, we got some breaking news here with the two new products coming out this next year, and I'm beta genuinely tests. they're just tests. Okay, be, be, beta <laughs> tests. Sorry, yes, beta tests. Uh, and I'm genuinely looking forward to seeing what the Times does with games and their other content going forward. As I mentioned at the very top of the uh, the, the episode, I'm a big fan of of the Times. A big subscriber to pretty much all of your content um, and uh, excited to see where you you take things, Jonathan. Nico, thanks so much. It's so great to catch up with you and I really appreciate the invite. Yeah. And I also want to say a big thank you as always to our listeners. We'll be back uh, next week with more interviews, more insights, more analysis uh, from the weird and wonderful world of not just Web3, but gaming more broadly. Uh, so until next time, friends, stay crypto curious and feel free to send questions guest recommendations and comments to me. My email is nico at novic.co and you can find me on Twitter at Nico the Finn. DMs are always open. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, level up your insights with our premium research platform, Novic Pro, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.